All right, for this video, we're going to talk about the various network planning techniques, specifically CPM and PERT. Um, these were both, both of these methods were developed in the 1950s. The CPM method was developed by uh, DuPont for their chemical plants in 1957. And the project evaluation and review technique, which is PERT, uh, was developed by Booz, Allen, and Hamilton uh, for the US Navy in 1958. So they're both developed within just a couple years of each other for um, network planning. There's a lot of similarities between both of these methods and there's a couple differences as well. Uh, but the main thing that both of them review and consider is precedence relationships and how those relationships um, have interdependencies. So essentially looking at the steps in each one of these projects and what, um, what comes one after the next in regard to that project. The big difference between the two is that CPM assumes we know a fixed time estimate and there is no variability in the activity times. So if we believe that a project is going to take 16 weeks, then we just assume it's going to take 16 weeks. It's a fixed time with no variability. Within that project, there's going to be various activities that get us to that 16 week total time. So step one might be three weeks. Step two might be two weeks. And with CPM, we assume that there's no variability. We assume that they're just going to hit exactly what we forecasted of that three weeks for the first one and two weeks for the next one. So no variability. PERT uses a probability distribution for activity times to allow for some variability. It assumes that there's a pessimistic time, a most likely time, and then an optimistic time. So what's our worst case, our normal case, and then our best case scenarios using PERT. So, um, if you're that same project, if you assume it's going to take 16 weeks, PERT will tell us what's the probability that it actually happens in that 16 weeks. Is there a 95% probability that we're going to be on time? Or is there a 70% probability that it's going to be on time? And then how do we correct it? What, what activities do we look at to try and improve that probability to make sure that it happens on time? Um, before I get into any of these other slides, um, I've been doing this for, for many years now, and I've had many professional project managers in my classes. And most of them say that no matter how um, complicated the project is that they're working on, most of the time they use the CPM method, not the PERT method. So I've had people in the construction industry, the aerospace and defense, biotech, and many of these professional PMPs that are in my classes, even at the MBA level, they say, when they work on projects, they almost always use the CPM method versus PERT. Okay, some of the advantages of CPM and PERT. They are very useful when scheduling and controlling large projects. Like I mentioned in the last video, you don't use uh, project management for day-to-day -day tasks. You use them for large projects that are complicated. One of the advantages of CPM and PERT is that it's mathematically straightforward. It is... Um, Two weeks plus two weeks equals four weeks. Three week plus one week equals four weeks. So pretty simple math when you're doing these projects. The graphical networks help to highlight the relationships among the project activities. So you'll see when we draw an AON network diagram later that it's very easy to see, you know, what steps precede others and what needs to be done before other activities can start. The critical path method, which we're going to learn throughout this uh, chapter, and slack time, they help us to pinpoint the activities that need to be watched. So when you're doing a project, you have to do every activity. If there's 20 steps in that project, you have to do all 20. But some of them are more critical than others to make sure that the project happens on time. So those activities are called the critical activities, and they are on a critical path. And then the other advantage of CPM and PERT, useful, useful in monitoring um, not just schedules, but also costs as well. So you can assign costs to every activity. And as that activity starts to be completed, you can assign those costs and you can see how you're doing in regards to the project's finances as well. So lots of advantages of CPM and PERT, mainly that it's, it's straightforward, it's mathematically easy, it's visually very easy to keep track of, it helps with communicating to the team, and you can manage costs as well um, as time estimates. Okay, some of the limitations of CPM and PERT. Project activities have to be clearly defined, independent, and stable in their relationships. So um, 
earlier in the example where I was talking about it's going to be a 16 week completion time. If you're wrong on your estimate for one of those activities, your entire project estimate is wrong as well. So all of the activities have to have really good time and cost estimates. Um, otherwise, it's, it's going to be um, inaccurate. The precedence relationships must be specified and networked together. So again, you've got to know what is step one, what is step two, what is step three, what is step four. And I know that sounds simple, but when you're talking about enormous projects, it's not always straightforward about what, what steps have to be taken to get us to that end goal. Time estimates tend to be subjective and are subject to fudging by managers. Sometimes managers do this intentionally and sometimes they do it unintentionally. Uh, with time estimates, um, if you're, people are generally optimistic, right? So if I say, hey, something's going to take me two weeks to complete, it might take me three. I didn't mean to intentionally give a poor date uh, or time estimate. Uh, it's just the, the nature of uh, how people estimate their time. Sometimes, sometimes companies intentionally give poor data. My wife used to work for a construction firm um, and they would, they would say whatever uh, they needed to win the job. So if it was, if someone wanted the project completed in three months and they thought it would take them four, they would just say three months. And that's unethical, but that's what they did to win that business. And so um, definitely some time estimate fudging there. And then last on the slide for the limitations of CPM and PERT is that there's an inherent danger of placing too much emphasis on the longest or critical path. Like I said just a couple minutes ago, every activity in a project has to be completed. You have to, If there's 20 steps, you have to do all 20. But if 10 of those are on the critical path, sometimes people get overly focused on just the 10 critical activities. And then the other 10 activities in that project might slip because you're not paying close enough attention to them. So that's the inherent danger of the critical path method. It's focusing on only the critical tasks and forgetting about all the other ones. So that's one of the limitations of CPM and PERT. Okay, so our steps for CPM and PERT are exactly the same, the first six steps. We're going to define the project and prepare the work breakdown structure. Okay, so define the project, create the steps. Then we're going to develop the relationship among the activities. Decide which activities precede and which ones must follow. Okay, so what's step one? What's step two? What's step three? So those are that's uh, step number two in um, our steps for CPM and PERT. Number three is draw the network connecting all the activities. We'll go over an AON network diagram in just a second here, but you want to visually see how those steps are all uh, interlinked between each other. Step four is assign time or cost estimates to each activity. When you're doing this for your career, you're going to have to go out there and get those time and cost estimates for this class that will be given to you. Step five is to compute the longest time path through the network. This is called the critical path. Okay, I'll cry a little inside when I see those of you who get your quiz questions or exam questions wrong when I say, what's the critical path? And you say, oh, it's the one with the most steps or, oh, it's the shortest time through the path. No, the critical path is the longest time through the path. Okay, the longest time path through the entire network. That's the critical path. And so you compute that and you figure out how long the project is going to take to complete. And then step six is you use the network to help plan, schedule, and monitor, and control the project. So everything we talked about in the last lecture recording, uh, planning, scheduling, and controlling, you use uh, the AON network diagram and the output of that to help um, control the project. Okay, activity on node network conventions. So under the AON method, activity on node method, nodes, which are circles, Represent activities and arcs, which are arrows. Define the precedence relationship between the activities. We're only going to go over AON network diagram, so activity on nodes. We are not going to do anything activity on arrow um, diagrams. The book gives a couple examples, and you can pay attention to those. It's still a good knowledge to have. Uh, but we're just going to use nodes because they're easier and they're visually more. Um, they're, they're, you can follow along with the nodes better than you can with arrows. An immediate predecessor. Okay, this slide is, is mainly talking about what are immediate predecessors. These are activities that need to be completed immediately before another activity. So the software that we use, Microsoft Project or whatever you use, many times it will help us to determine what these nodes are and what steps um, uh, are the immediate predecessors. But for, for sake of learning and how we're going to visually draw these out manually, um, 
we need to understand the concept. Think about the concept is that if you look on the far left of the screen, okay, the far left of the screen, A and B must be completed before they can start task C. Okay, you cannot start task C until activity A and activity B have been completed. So A and B are immediate predecessors to activity C. So let's, I'm going to use building a house as an example. If activity C is do the roofing, then A could be frame the house and B could be uh, pour the foundation. So you definitely can't put the roof on a house until the foundation is poured and the house is framed. Okay, so those are immediate predecessors to putting on a roof. Okay, activities B and C must be complete before you can, before you can start C. On the right hand side of the screen now, A must be completed before you can start activities B and activities C. So A is an immediate predecessor to these two activities. Okay, so using a house as an example again, um, if B is do uh, electrical work and C is frame the house, then A would be pouring the concrete, uh, pouring the foundation. Again, you can't do anything without a foundation in the house. So uh, if that is your first step, that must be done before you can start activities B and C. Some definitions for the critical path method. Okay, the critical path method is an approach to scheduling and controlling project activities. The critical path is the sequence of activities that take the longest time, the longest time, and that defines the total project completion time. So if you calculate out that your critical path is 16 weeks, that project is anticipated to take 16 weeks. Critical activities are those activities on the critical path. Uh, so these are the ones that uh, you cannot let those time uh, those times slip or the entire project will slip. Um, and then slack, the allowable slippage for the path, this is the difference in the length of the path and the length of the critical path. So act, there's going to be activities that do not fall on the critical path. Those activities can have slack or slippage because they're not critical to that timeline that you've calculated using the critical path method. You still have to do them. And if you ignore them and they slip past the allowable slippage time, then they can also delay a project. Okay, so if you ignore items that are not on the critical path and then they slip, that can make the whole project timeline slip as well. For our class, we are going to use these nodes. Okay, our alternative method is um, uh, what I what I call Sudoku squares. So the critical path method provided by the text is on the far left. You can see it's a circle and it's got some squares and it's nice, but it's missing slack time. We want to calculate out the slack time as well. So for our class, we're just going to use Sudoku squares. Okay. And all of these definitions are exactly the same. There's your in, which is your identification number or symbol for the activity. So instead of saying frame the house, we're going to assign an identification number to every step. So A might be frame the house. B might be do electrical. C might be install roofing. Whatever it may be, you're going to assign an identification number or a symbol to each activity. T is the activity duration. This is the normal time to complete the activity. In this class, we're going to use weeks in almost every example. So whether that's two weeks or three weeks or five weeks, that would be your T. Your earliest start is the earliest time in which an activity can start, assuming all the predecessors have been completed. So you cannot start an activity until all the predecessors before that have been completed, and that's your earliest start time. Your earliest finish is the earliest finish at a time in which an activity can be finished. Okay, pretty self-explanatory. But when you take your earliest start, you add on your time, that gives you your earliest finish. So if your early start is in week five, and your time estimate for that activity is two weeks. Your earliest finish is seven weeks. Five weeks is your early start. Two weeks is your time. Therefore, your early finish is five plus two equals seven. 
Okay, your latest start. That's the latest time at which an activity can start as to not delay the completion time of the entire project. Okay, so you cannot start after the latest start date or your project is going to slip. And whether that's something on the critical path or um, not on the critical path, it, that holds true. So it cannot slip as to delay the completion time for the entire project. Your latest finish is the latest time by which an activity has to be done so that project does not slip. And then last but not least is your slack time. Your slack time is the length of time an activity can be delayed without affecting the completion date for the entire project. And we are going to compute the slack time by taking LS, your latest start, minus your early start, and that will give you a number for your slack time. You can also do it at, on the right-hand side. Take your latest finish minus your early finish, and that will give you your slack time. And a piece of advice is if you ever get a different slack time on the right or the left, you have done it wrong. The slack time on the left and the slack time on the right always have to be exactly the same number, or you have somewhere gone wrong in your analysis up to this point. Okay, this is a very useful slide to have handy while you're doing your homeworks, quizzes, and exams. This is your CPM steps and rules. So everything up at the top of this slide is, you know, the identification number, your activity duration, your time to complete. Um, but there are some steps that we're going to take when we do our AON network diagram for, um, for the critical path method. Step one. Step one is called our forward pass. Okay, your first early start time always equals zero. So every project starts at week zero. Rule number one of step one is your early finish equals your early start time plus your time. So rule number one, the EF equals your early start plus your time equals your early finish. So if your early start time is three weeks, if your time is two weeks, therefore your early finish is five weeks. I think I just said three weeks, two weeks. So uh, hopefully I'm, I'm following my own made up numbers here. So if your early start time is three weeks, your time is two weeks, then your early finish would be five weeks. Rule number two, the early start time for an activity equals the largest EF time of all the immediate predecessors. So the largest EF time of the immediate predecessors. If you have a couple immediate predecessors going into that activity, you pick the one with the largest EF time. Okay. For step two, our backwards pass. This is where we're going to calculate out the latest start time and the latest finish time. So first we go left to right. We're doing our forward pass. That's going to give us our early finish times and our early start times. Then we're going to do a backwards pass. We're going to go right to left, and that's going to give us our latest finish and latest starts. So rule number three in the backward pass, your latest start time equals your latest finish minus time. So now you're going to take your latest finish time minus the time, and that'll give you your latest start time. So if your latest finish time is week seven, if your activity time is one week, then your latest finish would be six weeks. Seven minus one equals six. The latest finish time for an activity equals the smallest latest start time for all the immediate predecessors. So if you've got a couple immediate predecessors, or sorry, immediate successors, immediate successors, not predecessors, then when your backwards pass, your smallest LS time is the one that you will pick. And we're going to go over this in a different uh, video. We'll, we'll do a couple examples together. And right now I know it's, it's uh, a little confusing, but it will make a lot of sense when we do an example together. Step three is to calculate the slack time. So that's ST equals your latest start minus your early start and or your latest fin finish minus your early finish. And if those two numbers are different, then you have messed up somewhere along this process. Okay, um, again, this is an example of an AON network diagram using the circles, but for our class, we are going to use the Sudoku squares. So you can draw them out using the nodes or the circles and then 
as we do them together, we will put them in the Sudoku squares. Our forward pass, where we calculate the early start and early finish, this is where you this is where you sip, where you multiply and take the largest number, and your backward pass is where you subtract and take the smallest number. So going back to this slide real quick, your forward pass you're always going to add and look for the largest EF time. On your backward pass, you're going to subtract and take the smallest LS time. So forward pass, you're going to calculate that early start and early finish. On our backward pass, we're going to calculate the latest start and the latest finish. And then after we've done all that, we're going to calculate the slack. And that will complete an AON network diagram for the critical path method.